A war in Ukraine, a leaked Supreme Court draft opinion, a flash crash in Europe, but what mattered to global Wall Street was the Fed. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Bob Prince of Bridgewater and Ed Hyman of Evercore ISI on the beginning of a shift in the tectonic plates of monetary policy. And special contributor Larry Summers and Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution on the future of the dollar in a post-post Cold War. As for the dollar, well, I hardly need to tell you, David, that it's actually been extraordinarily strengthened uh, in the last uh, 10 weeks. We had a week full of surprises from the unprecedented leak of a draft majority opinion on abortion. The Supreme Court has confirmed that the Roe v. Wade opinion draft, of course, first leaked by Politico, it is authentic. It goes far beyond the concern of whether or not there is the right to choose. Last night, a shocking, shocking new breach, almost certainly in an effort to stir up an inappropriate pressure campaign to sway an outcome. To a flash crash in Europe that made 300 billion euros disappear, or at least for a few minutes. Citigroup says its London trading desk was behind Monday's flash crash in Europe. Shares across the continent tumbled after a sudden 8% decline in Swedish stocks. City says one of its traders made an error when inputting a transaction. But in the end, it wasn't what we didn't expect that drove the week, it was what we did expect. And that signaled a big change from the days of loose monetary policy as the Fed raised rates by 50 basis points and Chair Jay Powell said he's still hoping for a soft landing, but recognizes it may be difficult. I do expect that this will be very challenging. It's not gonna be easy. And it may well depend, of course, on events that are not in our, under our control. And the markets, well, they didn't like it one little bit, despite solid jobs numbers coming in on Friday. But equities shooting up after the Fed's announcement on Wednesday, only to shoot back down on Thursday, with some more sell-off coming on Friday. And it was the Nasdaq that got hit the worst, down over 1.5% on the week, while the S&P fell for the fifth straight week, marking the longest losing streak in a decade and hitting its 19th, kind of 19th new low this year alone, while bonds reflected all the angst that the Fed tightening triggered, with the 10-year yield adding over 20 basis points for the week, ending up at 3.13. To help us make some sense out of what was a tumultuous week, welcome now Bob Prince. He's co-CIO of Bridgewater Associates and Ed Hyman, chairman of Evercore ISI. Welcome to both of you. Great to have you here. So, Ed, I want to start with you because I watched your video from a couple days ago, and you said you've never seen in your career, and it is quite a career, one of the original people on Wall Street, we're going to say, you've never seen this kind of dis disconnect between the markets on the one hand and the economy on the other. Well, I'm catching up. <laughs> I'm, I'm beginning to figure it out. Uh, so what happened this week, uh, you mentioned the 20 basis point uh, increase in bond yields. And I see now that's the problem. And I've gone back uh, really since then. I've looked at 1987. And bond yields just went straight up. They went up to over 10%. And they kept going up. Uh, and they went up so high, they finally killed the stock market. And so that's... I now I've, I'm sort of getting it. And in that period, the economy was fine. Uh, even when the market went down 30%, the economy stayed fine. Uh, and the Fed finally had to eat back off. Uh, but that's, that's the issue. Uh, and, you know, that issue is being driven by uh, inflation worries. And the price of oil was up, I think, five, $5 this, this week. Uh, it's not made a new high, but it's moving back up. And uh, so there, there you have it. The economy's good. Uh, earnings are good. Earnings have uh, come in strong in the f for the first quarter. Uh, but rates are going up, and inflation's a worry. And, you know, Larry Summers is <laughs> on your show. I've, I've been with him all the way on inflation's not transitory. Uh, but that's, that's the issue right there. So, so, Bob, Ed says that's the problem. Is it also the solution? Because if we really have a lot of inflation, don't we have to tighten monetary conditions? Don't we have to get the yields up in order to get our arms around the inflation? Yeah, well, we think we're at the beginning of a process. Uh, we're at the beginning of a challenging period. The markets have discounted a tightening, but there hasn't really been a tightening yet. 
So we're going to find out, we're, as, as the Fed plays the game, we're going to find out how they play it. Um, they're probably confronted with the most challenging set of circumstances in the last, like, 60 years, 50, 60 years, since the 70s, which is a monetary inflation. The inflation that we've experienced in the last 20 years is what we might call a cyclical inflation. You get, you know, strong growth, low unemployment, you know, gets, you get a little bit of inflation, they tighten preemptively against it. But by and large, money and credit growth was relatively stable. Nominal growth was not too high. What we have now is a monetary inflation, which was brought about by the injection of a massive amount of money and credit into the system, which is now getting spent in the form of nominal GDP, nominal spending. And that nominal spending is way more than the output, and as a natural result of that, you get prices going up. So as you play that out going forward, um, it's, it, it's become a self-reinforcing process. We've got a, we've got a self-reinforcing inflation cycle going on, which is due to monetary considerations. And so what's gonna be required to reverse that would be to reduce money and credit, you know, comparable to, to, the, to the money and credit that was put in. The challenge when you have a monetary inflation like this is it becomes very difficult for the Fed to simultaneously get the inflation rate that they want and the growth rate that they want. So you, you typically then have to err on the side of, to, to have the growth rate you want, you, you accept too high of inflation, or if you fight inflation, you get a recession. So that's, we're just in the beginning of that game right now. So, and how much of that are we doing already? I mean, you've pointed out in your charts, the M2 is actually coming down. It had been growing yeah, dramatically. So. It's starting to come down already. They're about to start selling off the balance sheet, taking some out that way. Are we already on our way to getting our arms around inflation through so, really getting control of money? So, David, you, you shouldn't have Bob and myself on this show together. Because <laughs> <No. 'cause laughs> what you just uh, laid out, you know, as you know, I agree with 125%. Uh, you know, we had a huge increase in the uh, checks to people. The balance sheet went up like crazy, and that manifests itself in a huge increase in the money supply. And now we're just trying to figure out how to get rid of that thing. Uh, so we got up to about 30% on a year-on-year -year basis, and in March it was down to 10%, and I would guess in April it's probably 7%. Uh, so we've, we've uh, already done quite a bit because we're not sending checks out anymore. Uh, and the uh, balance sheet's gonna start to run off now. So we've made some progress, and I'd say, Bob, that uh, I've been surprised at how much uh, has happened uh, with just a 1% funds rate, mm -hmm. no shrinking of the balance sheet, suddenly mortgage rates are up 250 basis points, the dollar's up 15%, and the stock market's down almost 15%, and some stocks have been, you know, really, they're down 50 or 70%. So are the markets doing part of the Fed's job for it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, but probably not enough. Um, and I, um, the, you know, Ed raises the point that the, um, the financial markets are much weaker than the economy. That's kind of the reverse of where we were for a while, where the financial markets were much stronger than the economy. And th that does relate to the kind of things he's talking about, where, you know, if you take something like money supply, uh, money supply is not growing like it was. The Fed's not injecting money as they were. They're going to be drawing it out. But if you look at an economy, we sort of look at it in a, in a, in a very simple way, which is there's a the total amount of sources of funds, and then there's where they go, the uses of funds. And they can, the sources, there are really only three sources of funds. You've got the money supply, you've got credit, and you've got income. And that goes into spending, and it goes into financial markets, and then there's this, a residual that sits out in, with the Fed. And the, it, w what's interesting is that different things go in different places. When you inject money in the system, it tends to go into the financial markets. Credit tends to go into spending. So what we've got going on right now is the tightening has reduced the flow of money into the financial markets. So we've got a hole in the bond market. We've got yields going up. But the credit is going into spending. So spending is staying, staying high, but interest rates and price are going up and prices are going down. It's the opposite of where we were. And this is going to be a real balancing act because if you're the Fed and you tighten 
and the stock market falls and the bond yield goes up, but the spending and the inflation continues, you know, how do you play that game? It's not going to be easy. So, so, Ed, we did get jobs numbers in the United States on Friday at the very end of the week. We're still creating a lot of uh, good jobs. Is that helping or is that hurting? We've got a lot more jobs. That would increase, actually, the amount of money people have to spend. Uh, wages are going up. So is that helping or is that hurting? Well, that's a good question <laughs> because, uh, you know, the Fed wants the economy to slow down. And so this is one of the uh, good news is bad news uh, programs. Uh, but employment, uh, when you sit down and think about the economy, it's very complicated, uh, housing, capital spending, uh, credit expansion. Um, but employment's everything. And whether you work for Bloomberg or Bridgewater or a casino, you count it in employment. And employment is definitely strong. Uh, I must have half a dozen measures of employment. And they're all strong, like the employment numbers that came out today. Uh, I've been surprised that wages look like they might be slowing a little bit, but they're still quite rapid. Uh, and I hadn't quite thought about, Bob, what you said, but uh, bank loans are now really taken off. Yeah. And so that's in your three-part program. The, the money supply is slowing, but now the bank loans are, are starting to go up. Uh, so I'm still, I haven't quite figured out uh, how I think this is going to play out because uh, in a period like 87, the economy really just kept on going. And also in uh, another soft landing period of uh, 98, when you had the Russia crisis and LTCM, uh, you look back at it, I, I thought we were... I thought we were completely dead, <laughs> but the economy, you know, came right, right on through. So it'll be very interesting to see you know, how, how we thread the needle on, on this. But I think we'll reach a point uh, where uh, the community will decide uh, that the Fed can take a little off the get break right now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not there yet. I mean, we're not even <laughs> hardly started. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I, Ed had an interesting chart where he, you just added employment growth and wage growth, and I think they added, they added up to 9%. Right. Right? That's basically income. Yeah. So if you got 9% income growth, you're going to get 9% spending growth because people spend their money. And if you got 9% spending growth but output can't grow by 9%, you're going to have inflation. So um, the... You're probably at a peaking process. Like I think Ed points out, you've had a rise in bond yields. You've had some tightening from the stock market, the dollar, and uh, money supply slowing down a little bit. But I think as you play that forward, one of the things you have to think through is uh, where does that all settle? You may get a, it may get a turn like this, but where does it settle? And if it settles at an inflation rate of 4 or 5%, is that going to be accepted by the Fed? Or, and if you look at what's priced into the bond market yeah. and, the, and the interest rate markets, the short-term interest rate's only priced to go up a little over 3%. So if I had a 4 or 5% inflation rate, I'm stuck with a negative real yield on cash. Yeah. And the inflation rate that's priced in for the future is only 27 yeah. So it, where you settle out is as important as the turning points that you have. Sounds right to me. Bob Prince and Ed Hyman will be staying with us as we turn from what happened this week to what investors can do about it all. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Ed Hyman of Evercore ISI and Bob Prince of Bridgewater Associates have stayed with us as we turn our attention to what investors can do with the uncertainty and change that they face just about everywhere they turn right now. So, Bob, let's start with you. Goodness knows you're responsible for a lot of investment. Uh, if we talk about an investor rather than a trader, what do you do with your analysis of where we are on the market right now? Well, the first principle is diversification, right? So if you have a diversified portfolio, you could just sort of go through the ups and the downs and you being confident about the other side. And then if you want to tactically move around that, you can do that. So you first thing you have to have a start with a diversified portfolio. And the problem is 
most people don't have a very well diversified portfolio. If you know, if you have even stocks and bonds, let's just say you have a balance of stocks and bonds. If we're headed into a stagflation environment, and I wouldn't say we're there yet, but we're on the cusp of that. Stagflation meaning high inflation with low growth. Um, that's actually, if you go back historically and you study stagflations, the worst asset in a stagflation is equities. It's even worse if you're in a stagflation and you get an aggressive tightening of monetary policy. We're somewhere in the vicinity of that. So equities by themselves is not a safe place. It may work out, but it's not a safe place and it's not diversified. But even to hold bonds, bonds do poorly in stagflation because the inflation problem and the tightening of monetary policy. Cash does very badly. Cash is not safe because you lock in a negative real yield on cash and you have, you have uh, basically assured wealth destruction. So you need some way of benefiting from a rise in inflation uh, to at least balance those two uh, forces. And so whether it's inflation index bonds or whether it's commodities, a diversified basket of commodities, you need to get that kind of, uh, that kind of diversification in the portfolio. And I think within the equity market, there's a, a, you know, I think the thing you really need to pay attention to is the cash flows of the assets. You know, we've been in an environment where Cash flow didn't matter too much. It was, you know, where things are going to play out 10 years from now. But if you're in an environment of high nominal growth, that, uh, that spending will be the income to companies, and that income will be profits. And so in the short run, you, you'll face risk from the tightening. But over time, if you're invested in equities that have a reliable cash flow stream, you know, Warren Buffett said in the long run, in the short run, the stock market's a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. That's because cash flows accumulate over time. So even within the equity market, I think it's important to be thinking about that. So, Ed, as you look at the markets, the various markets right now, I, I heard commodities. Is commodities a good investment, do you think? Are commodities about to go up more? Um, They're already gone up a bit. gone up a lot. So I, I like the diversification idea. Uh, given... Uh, what we talked about at the beginning of uh, uncertain times, the uh, difference between the markets and the economy. Uh, I like cash. I, I know I'm not really. I'm not getting ahead on cash, but I get my cash back. But you're actually falling behind if you have substantial inflation, right? Yeah, I, but I think inflation is going to be about four, about four uh, percent. But I'm saying just uh, if I was adv advising people, I would say first let's have a you know a certain amount of cash so you can sleep at night and you're not worried if your house price goes down or your stock values go down. Uh, but diversification, and uh, I, I like the idea that uh, hard assets or commodity-like things, energy sector, uh, sort of industrial renaissance idea, uh, I like that some, but I'm, I'm not as uh, negative on the tech sector as the stocks are. I mean, I, think, I still think we're in you know, a pretty rich technology revolution. Uh, but, you know, that's the, the stock market. And real estate is, you know, it's too expensive. Uh, but, you know, not the worst thing you can do. So is everything else. So is there, that's one of the problems, really, is that everything else is expensive. Uh, so I like your, your diversification, you know, plus some cash in case something happens. But I, I really, uh, I don't, I, I'm pretty, uh, I'm not that negative on the outlook. We've been talking about various sectors here in terms of diversification. What about geographic diversification? What do you think about non-U.S. investments, Bob? Well, it's increasingly important. Um, we break the world down into three regions. There are three major monetary regimes, monetary and credit systems in the world. There's a dollar system, there's a euro system, and now there's an RMB system mm -hmm. uh, uh, in China. And, well, you, and so you can break the world down into North America, Europe, and Asia. It doesn't have to be China. I think it's Asia. And Asia has been a great diversifier um, for, uh, relative to North America, relative to Europe. And so geographic diversification is going to be uh, much more valuable in the future than it was in the past because you increasingly have uh, China is much more of a, a powerful independent economic zone with an independent monetary policy, whereas up to 2015, they had a linked exchange rate to the dollar, and they, they really were not so independent. 
but they're they're driving themselves to be much more of a you know the domestic economy is the mainstay and so the more they have an independent economy independent monetary system and that'll spill over to the rest of asia geographic diversification is going to be really important just quickly here at the end independent but how independent uh, do you have to be concerned with the deglobalization of the, the Probably. globe uh, you know that keeps the inflation rate a little bit higher uh, but david i'd like to say that not exactly related to this, but boy, we have a really a funny economy where Europe and China are in trouble and the U.S. is doing pretty well. Well, that's for sure. We saw that with the Bank of England just this week, basically yes. projecting stagflation or the equivalent of stagflation, it looked like. Yeah. It's a practical matter. Thank you so much. Really great to have the two of you here. I hope you come back. This is a great conversation. That's Bridgewater's Bob Prince and also Ed Hyman of Evercore ISI. Coming up, we'll take a look at what's happening next week on Global Wall Street. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at what's coming up next week, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. This week's Philippine election is a key watch for investors in Asia, with the winner needing to navigate shifting relations in the region. The son of a late dictator, a champion boxer turned senator, and a movie star turned mayor are among the mostly male candidates vying to succeed President Duterte. The front runner is Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., son of the exiled former president, and Imelda Marcos. The only female in the race, opposition leader Lenny Robredo, has promised to take a tougher stance towards China and is the investor pick to oversee the economic recovery amid rising inflation. Now over to Danny Berger in London. Danny. Thanks, Juliet. For this coming week, the focus will specifically be on how the energy story in Europe unfolds in the context of the war in Ukraine. Over the previous week, Ursula von der Leyen announced a full EU ban of Russian oil. What exactly will that look like? How do they wean themselves off Russian oil by the end of the year, as had been declared, because it is a region that is so dependent on Russia? So we'll be looking for any details of that, as well as any response from Russia and, of course, any response in the energy markets. Now over to Romain Bostic in New York. Thanks, Danny. With more than 80 percent of the S&P 500 having reported earnings, a clearer picture is emerging about the health of the nation's largest companies. Next week, about three dozen S&P members will report, including Tyson Foods, Disney, Walmart, Target, Home Depot, and Deere. But there also will be a wider swath of hundreds of small and mid-cap companies in the Russell 2000 that report. Some of the more notable names include energy companies like Duke, department stores like Macy's, and discretionary stocks, including Callaway Golf. Economic data on tap will center around Wednesday's release of the Consumer Price Index for April, Economists expect a second straight month of inflation running at 8 plus percent year over year. That would complete a full 12 month cycle where inflation has run multiples above the Fed's 2 percent target. And finally, keep an eye on Facebook's parent company, which has staked its future on the metaverse, but it still sees a need to stay grounded in the physical world. It plans to open its first ever brick and mortar store next week, but it's largely to showcase hardware devices to help you plug in to the alternate reality that Facebook is trying to create. David? Thanks to Juliet Sally, Danny Berger, and Romaine Bostic. Coming up, cutting Russia off from the global financial system. Are we driving people into the arms of crypto? We talk about the post-post-Cold War world with special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard and Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Every week on this program, we have the privilege of being joined by Larry Summers of Harvard, the former Treasury Secretary. Well, that privilege is actually increased this week. We have not only Larry Summers, but also Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution. They are out there for a Hoover Institution event, a conference on monetary policy, which is particularly appropriate. So welcome, Larry and Neil. Great to have you. Larry, let me start with you. We've talked about inflation so many times, what the Fed should do. The Fed actually acted this week. Is the Fed getting its arms around inflation finally? 
I think the Fed's uh, moving in the right uh, direction. I think that's a good thing. Uh, whether they're moving strongly enough and whether it's going to be enough to bring inflation durably under control, I think is still very much uh, in question. You know, the labor market is looking very, very tight. Uh, the JOLTS data showed uh, even higher ratio of vacancies to unemployed than we'd had uh, before. And so I think there are still very real challenges ahead of us. I'm not sure the Fed needed to be quite as prescriptive with respect to what it was going to do in the future um, as, uh, as it was. Uh, so I still think we've got a very difficult uh, challenge ahead of us, and we're still in very turbulent waters. Well, to that point, Larry, were you surprised when the chair, Jay Powell, essentially took off the table 75 basis point rate hike? I was surprised that he took it off the table as firmly as he did and in the same couple of paragraphs started talking about core CPI having come down and hinted towards the possibility that at some point they'd be able to move uh, to 25s. Those things could happen, but I think the lesson of the last year and a half is that we can't predict and therefore we mostly do damage to credibility when in official set circles we make uh, strong predictions. Neil, you're a noted historian of the economy, of financial matters. If we look back at history, the historical track record of central banks being able to deal with this kind of inflation without going into recession is not particularly a happy one. Well, David, I thought we'd learnt the lessons of the 1970s, but it seems like at some point uh, we forgot them again. In the 1970s, of course, uh, the Fed uh, sought to tighten, uh, but would periodically lose heart and blink. And uh, for more than a decade, monetary policy failed to get on top of an inflation problem. It's not an exactly uh, perfect analogy, but there are a couple of things that are really striking to me. Uh, one is that this problem began with an error of monetary and fiscal policy, which Larry, of course, pointed out in February of last year. Uh, but then, uh, as happened in the 70s, we get a geopolitical shock on top of that initial policy mistake, and inflation expectations are, are then away and, and unanchored. And, and th in, th in this sense, I think the war in Ukraine is performing a similar role to the war of 1973 in the Middle East, which, remember, administered a shock not only to oil prices, but also to food prices. Uh, so in that sense, I think uh, the analogy is quite good. And I, I agree with Larry. I don't think the Fed has nearly done enough, uh, and it has a hard road ahead. It's also going to come under pressure at some point to blink uh, if we continue to see uh, the stock market selling off, the bond market is in trouble. Uh, and we have a much more complex and large financial system than we had in the 1970s with a much higher stock of debt. Therefore, it's more sensitive to, to interest rate moves. So it's a long and, I think, very rugged road ahead for the Fed. Larry Neal quite appropriately says we have the geopolitics of all of this uh, on top of what we've seen with a pandemic and then, of course, with this inflation and extraordinary fiscal and monetary stimulus. Talk about the geopolitics and where we are in geopolitics. A after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after Soviet Union collapsed, we thought we had a new Pax Americana. That's lasted a reasonably short period of time. We're now actually sort of in a post-post-Cold War era. What does that look like in terms of the economy? David, let me just say first that I think uh, Neil got it exactly right. One thing he said that I'm not so sure of is that the economy is more sensitive to interest rates than it was in the 1970s. I think part of that complexity uh, that we're seeing in the economy means there's no longer the kind of credit rationing that there was in the 1970s. And so I suspect that it may take even more action from interest rates, uh, especially in light of the fact that higher interest rates now push up interest payments on government debt more than they did, which increases uh, spending power. So that question on the relative sensitivity of interest rates, uh, I'm not sure of. Look, I think we're in um, a different geopolitical era. I, you know, at some point, we'll call it something 
rather than just calling it the post post Cold War era. Larry, I but I don't Cold think Cold War Two. I mean, we're kind of in Cold War Two. Well, Neil thinks it's Neil thinks it is uh, Cold War Two. He may well turn out uh, to be right in that judgment. I have a sense that it's going to be more multipolar uh, than Cold War One uh, was. I think that uh, the single most neglected fact of the last decade was the 38 meetings that took place between uh, Premier Xi and Premier uh, Putin. That's more than in a decade the U.S. president has ever met with any head of state from any other country. And it's not like China and Russia are close uh, to each other. And so that kind of realignment is a big deal. What's also a big deal now, and I think a much bigger deal than it was uh, during the Cold War, is that there are these global security uh, threats like climate change, like proliferation, like uh, terrorism that make the equation much more complicated than it was during the Cold War. Neil, obviously Russia looms large right at the moment. There is a war going on, after all, in Ukraine, and the world in various ways is responding to that. But I dare say when it comes to the economy, uh, U.S. relations with China will be much more important going forward. What is going on with China right now? We, Larry talked about the relationship with Russia, but also in its economy itself, as it continues to have lockdowns, it continues to have a lot of uh, troubles. How bad off is the Chinese economy? Well, David, let me start with the Cold War II analogy. My point is that in this second Cold War, China's the senior partner and Russia's the junior partner. At the beginning of Cold War I, it was the other way around, uh, but they were just as close at the beginning uh, of the first Cold War. Uh, and in this Cold War, the, the hot war has broken out in Europe, in Ukraine. In the first Cold War, it was Korea. Uh, so I think there's really quite a good an analogy here. The problem for China is, is that amidst this geopolitical crisis, they're still battling uh, COVID. And after the hubris of claiming that they had solved the problem, unlike us incompetent Westerners, uh, they, they now face nemesis in the form of the Omicron variant, which their zero COVID policy is really struggling to contain. So if you look at mobility data in China, it's not quite as bad as it was in early 2020, but it's pretty bad. Uh, and so the Chinese economy is really in an extremely uh, impeded state because of the restrictions that they're having to impose, not only in Shanghai, but multiple cities. What's interesting, and I'd like to throw this at Larry, actually, is what does this mean for inflation? I mean, my sense is that the reduction of Chinese demand for oil is probably on net good from the vantage point of those worried about uh, monetary policy and inflation uh, because it takes a little bit of the heat out yeah. of, uh, of demand uh, for oil and therefore the price of energy. I don't know if that's your view, Larry. My, my guess is that China is going to be less big deal for inflation than many people think because there are two effects. There's the demand destruction for yeah. commodity effect that you mentioned and there's the uh, interfered with supply chains right. effect uh, that others focus on. I can't figure out which one's bigger. And since I can't figure out which one's bigger, I kind of suspect mm -hmm. they're probably not that far from uh, being, in being in equipoise. I do think there's a chance that if China gets past this, you're going to see some big surge in demand from China for oil before you see the supply chains yeah. uh, fix themselves uh, completely. And I think that the effect of everybody trying to shorten their supply chain is going to be permanently at least a little bit uh, inflationary. OK, Larry Summers and Neil Ferguson will be staying with us as we turn to the specific question of how the geopolitics may be affecting the world monetary order. That's coming up on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Today, we are presenting our sixth package of sanctions. We need sanctions, more courageous sanctions. We are always open to additional sanctions. 
Sanctions, they're at the center of efforts to help Ukraine in its war against Russia. And as City CEO Jane Fraser explains, excluding Russia from the world financial system is key. We're separating a G20 country from the financial markets and we're separating them from the supply chain in response to what they've done. I think because it's sending a lot of concern to many other countries around the world and they're concerned about therefore putting all their eggs into the Western financial order basket. Some have questioned whether those concerns about the Western financial basket could undermine the dominance of the U.S. dollar. But as former IMF chief economist Ken Rogoff of Harvard notes, there's little evidence of that, at least so far. The dollar is dominant in trade invoicing. It's dominant in uh, financial markets. It's dominant in uh, you know, all kinds of transactions. But whatever the immediate effects, the sanctions certainly bring to the fore the possible use in the future of cryptocurrencies as a way to avoid such sanctions, which Fed Chair Jay Powell says is another reason for crypto regulation. What's needed is a framework, and in particular, um, ways to prevent these unbacked cryptocurrencies from serving as a vehicle for terrorist finance and just general criminal behavior. Still with us are Larry Summers of Harvard and Neil Ferguson of the Hoover Institution. So let's pick up on this question about what the sanctions we've seen imposed on Russia might mean for the world monetary order. Neil, you wrote a terrific piece for Bloomberg, I must say, addressing this question and the possibility that it may change the world order the way prior conflicts and disasters have affected world order. How do you see it this time? Well, wars and plagues change the monetary system. It's not as if the monetary system is something that's the same over the centuries. Uh, when the war broke out 10 weeks ago, a number of theories did the rounds. Uh, both, both of the major theories were wrong. Number one was, uh, well, the Russians are going to get around sanctions using cryptocurrency. And the other theory was, wow, we've just done sanctions against uh, the Russian central bank. Everybody's going to want to get out of dollars uh, to be uh, uh, protected from future U.S. sanctions. Well, in fact, it turned out that there was really no way in any significant uh, scale that the Russians could evade sanctions with cryptocurrency, probably aid to Ukraine in the form of crypto mattered more. Uh, but even that's really quite trivial compared with the aid that the Ukrainians have got from the United States and its allies. As for the dollar, well, I hardly need to tell you, David, that it's actually been extraordinarily strengthened uh, in the last uh, 10 weeks, particularly against some currencies like uh, the Japanese yen. But that doesn't really have a whole lot to do with the war. I mean, to some extent, it does in the sense that in risk off situations, people turn to the dollar. But I think more importantly, the Fed is tightening and not all other central banks are keeping up with it. So I think there were a couple of wrong theories. Uh, I think the really interesting question to ask is not so much, is the dollar one day going to be replaced by another fiat currency? I mean, that, that debate has been going on throughout my entire lifetime. It was happening in the late 1960s. And I think it's the wrong question, as long as there isn't a com comparably large uh, and liquid attractive currency. Uh, at this point, the only potential contender would be the euro in terms of scale. Uh, but I don't really see that, that challenge as being a successful one. So the dollar is the dominant fiat currency in the existing monetary system. The question is, does technological change and the advent of new forms of electronic payment create an opportunity for alternative payment rails to the ones that are dominated by the dollar? I think that's an interesting question. And that brings us back to China, because it's China that's really been pioneering new forms of electronic payment, uh, including, of course, its own central bank digital currency. And Larry, I wonder if there's a connection between what Neil just said, the possibility of electronic payment systems, and something that we're hearing a lot of from countries other than the United States, which is a real concern, not only with the general scope of the sanctions against Russia, but specifically denying Russia access to dollar reserves located abroad. Uh, we hear reports that China basically has summoned in their banks to say, how can we protect our reserves from that sort of thing? Could that have longer ranging effects? on the way we keep our reserves, the way we transfer our funds? Let me start by trying a historical generalization on uh, Neil. Countries don't lose their power because their currencies deteriorate as central. They lose the centrality of their currencies because they lose their power. 
and that's then the least, and the currency is then the least of their problems. If I take uh, your native land and the British pound, the British didn't lose their centrality because of what happened to the pound. What happened to the pound because of their loss of centrality? And I think that's how it always is. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. The critical thing with the pound was that there was an alternative that was better. Britain's decline was, was paralleled by the rise of the United States. Uh, and so once Britain was really overstretched, which was already true in the 1920s and 1930s, in, in imperial terms and in fiscal terms, there was this alternative that was new kid in town, the US dollar. Whereas today, although you can see the US is in some ways overstretched and has a fiscal problem, there isn't really an alternative that you could immediately see as preferable. And this is a point that you've made, I think, quite rightly in your famous line, you know, the dollar is number one. What are the alternatives when, let me get this right, Europe's a museum, Japan's an elderly care home, uh, China's a jail, and Bitcoin's an experiment. One of your best lines, Larry. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for, the, for that one. Uh, uh, Neil, I'm glad you uh, appreciated it. Look, I don't think we're going to see a shift totally away from real world currency to metaverse currency anytime in the foreseeable future, because I think there's still going to need to be a bridge between the two. And that bridge is going to be the dollar. Yep. I also think that it's hard to imagine that in a world where money becomes less legally governed and more political, there's going to be increasing trust in Chinese money. And so for those reasons, <laughs> I think you're uh, going to see the dollar uh, remain central until you have seen other big surprises that are actually more important to the future of the world than whatever it is that's happening to the dollar. So I, I think of the dollar as much more symptom and much less cause than I think a lot of the discussion would have it. So, so point taken, Larry, it's basically the strength of the economy and the country involved more than anything else. But let's talk about the digital payment system that Neil talked about. Neil, specifically, it looks to me at least like central bank digital currencies are coming, whether it's China or whether it's Europe or whether it's the United States. When they come, does that increase the dominance of the dollar, take away from it, or is it just irrelevant, Neil? Well, I think we have to be a bit careful here. The, the central bank digital currency, the ECNY, that the People's Bank of China rather hastily rolled out uh, in 2020, 2021, is primarily designed to make sure that just about every transaction in China is under the direct surveillance of the Chinese Communist Party. I, I don't see why we would want to copy a system like that, uh, and I don't think that we should. Uh, rather, I think it would be preferable if the United States allowed all the innovation that's going on uh, in decentralized finance, in what's sometimes called cryptocurrency, to happen here in the United States. It's clear that the internet needs some kind of native payment system. Typing in your credit card number on random websites is not the way to go. And I think we're evolving that payment system. But as Larry rightly said, it's not an alternative to the dollar. We're still going to be paying our, our taxes and I guess most of our wages and salaries in dollars. It's complementary to it. It's not either or. So I don't think the US should unhesitatingly copy and paste central bank digital currency, especially not on the Chinese model. I think the question for the central bank, for the Federal Reserve is how do we manage things so that all the innovation that's going on in decentralized finance Finance, is beneficial to the United States economy, contributes to economic growth, and doesn't destabilize uh, the monetary system. And that, that's a very different question from should we have a central bank digital currency. Okay, thank you so very much to Neil Ferguson of Hoover Institution and our very special contributor here at Wall Street Week, Larry Summers of Harvard. Coming up, one more thought from Bloomberg's Stephanie Flanders. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought, and this week's comes from our senior executive editor for economics here at Bloomberg, Stephanie Flanders, on the challenges facing the rest of the world's central banks. 
Yeah, you think the Fed has it bad, but believe it or not, things are actually looking more difficult for most of the other world's central banks. If you, you take away from, from China for a moment, uh, this week you saw interest rate rises, not just from the Bank of England, but from the central banks in Australia, Brazil, Iceland, Poland, Chile, a bunch of other countries. And there were increases of 100 basis points, a full percentage point from Iceland and Brazil. Uh, we didn't see any rate increase in Turkey, but that's only because the central bank is under pressure by, from President Erdogan to stick with his rather, rather idiosyncratic approach to cutting inflation, which is to keep the price of money really low. It's not working out so well at the moment. Inflation in Turkey is more than 60%. That's the highest in the G20. The bigger risk for a lot of these central banks, certainly bigger than it currently looks in the US, is that inflation by itself will tip the economy into recession because you have these soaring food and energy prices which are so noticeable and affect people's real income so immediately, you could see these economies shrink. And in fact, we saw the European Central Bank officials there warning that the Eurozone economy was in effect already stagnating from the effect of rising energy prices and other things even when the central bank hasn't even raised interest rates at all. I think the country with the, w the worst of all worlds is Britain. It's facing, if you like, America's uh, very hot labor market, rising wages, but it's also got a kind of Europe style energy squeeze. It doesn't have those other sources of energy that the US has. So that, as the worst of all worlds, made a bit harder by the reduction in trade flows with the European Union that we've seen since the UK fully left the European single market just over a year ago. And that was all confirmed by the rather gloomy forecast from the Bank of England this week as it went for its fourth consecutive rate increase, but also produced forecasts showing inflation was going to hit 10% towards the end of this year, potentially, and that the economy might shrink next year. Although we tend to focus on the mistakes that the Federal Reserve has made and the bad hand that it's given itself to play, it's central banks in other parts of the world that will probably face the worst effects. And I'm thinking there particularly of developing countries who ran up a lot of debt as a result of COVID and are now going to see the cost of that debt potentially rise even as their economy shrinks in the face of this real income squeeze from rising food and energy prices. The other takeaway is for the credibility of central banks. If you think over the last 20 years, support for the WTO has waxed and waned. We've worried about support for NATO. Now we look at the G20 and wonder whether that's broken as an institution. But through all that, central bankers have been the ones we trusted to get the job done. Now, the most important central bank in the world, the Federal Reserve, has failed in its one job, quite spectacularly so. And if we look around the world, it looks like with the help of COVID, with the help of spendthrift governments and certainly President Putin, but central banks collectively could, re could end up not just cleaning up that mess, but actually making it a lot worse. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.